Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Yeah, Bitch. welcome to Drinking Bros podcast, kids. Tyler Gray is back on the show. One of our favorite movie stars. Um, never served in the military at all. Just We just know him from TV now, and he's a movie star. He was on some yeah, show with Bert. Yeah, do you get, do you get that a lot? By the way, now now that the show is huge, because you're on CBS SEAL Team, and uh, I'm sure people come up to you and they're like, "Holy shit, man! You do an awesome job at playing a, a dude in the military." Uh, no, um, no. Uh, I, ironically, though, what I do get constantly is is the opposite, which is people think I was a real SEAL. Mm. Ah, all right. I get that constantly to the point where i did like an ig live and i was like look i was not a seal i was army special operations um you know but not a seal and it's uh it's i can't be clear enough on that um i i mean i shit you not the amount of like ig uh messages i get from you know like teenagers and stuff that want to join or like you know how hard was buds and i'm like I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm surprised crazy. Hollywood hasn't outed you then of like, oh, we have a, a non-seal playing a seal. We got to get him out of there, man. You got to get him out I, of there. I used to joke, uh, not so much now, but like season one and two, I was like, I'm waiting. Any day I'm going to get a call from John Shipley or Don Shipley. <laughs> <laughs> Just say, you're <laughs> out, man. You're fucking yeah. pretender, you're dude. Shit. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, it's been the you know it's been a lot of um, been a lot of support. Um, the show's really uh, the fact that military people don't hate it. I think that speaks volumes. That's that's about as good as of a compliment as you can get. <laughs> it's been, when it's a veteran or a military show, and veterans are like, you know, they don't hate it. That that was that was our home run criteria in my mind. Yeah, I mean, you you guys have done a better job than any TV or a TV series or movie that I've ever seen personally. I mean, con- especially since it's a series, the consistency and a lot of that is attributed to the fact that the showrunners have been very amenable to allowing actual military personnel on the set. I mean, it's like anybody that's an extra or a stuntman for the most part is a goddamn seal from Coronado down there or, or Marine or some shit, right? It's, I, I mean, you know, somebody, and it's, I'm going to say this and it sounds so simple, but, but Ross, you know, you of uh, all people know that it's not our show has been able to do what it's done as far as its portrayal simply because they have the, the higher ups and from, you know, the, the top people, you know, the, the showrunner, the, the executive director, uh, Chris Chulak, Spencer, uh, you know, everyone, but it, to include, and here's the critical one to include CBS, at the end of the day, it's CBS's money, um, and they're the ultimate power. Obviously, it's also their network. Everyone has said, you know what? We think your guys' input is important, and let's freaking – let's give you avenues to give the input um, and, and allow us to give a, – A, listen, and then allow us to, to give that input. Um, because as you know, Ross, most times it's productions it's, don't it's, care. Yeah. They, they just – it's the opposite. Uh, they don't care. They want to get the shot. And, you know, you have directors come in, especially on a, on a series. You know, you get a new director every week. They come in and want to make their own Hollywood version of it. And it's like, hey, guys, we actually got some real people on the set here. And I think that helps probably ground it from week to week and ground these directors and being like, oh, shit. Yeah, man, I really can't fuck around with that. And, uh, and if there's a mistake here and there, you're probably going to get stopped or flag for it on set. I well, you're, I mean, his director is very like turning to Tyler or one of the other guys like, Hey, did that look right? Or whatever the fuck. I mean, they're, they're, uh, okay. who is, who is there when, or who's directing you there? The guy with the, well, David, uh, was DB was directing that day, but the, uh, guy with, oh, the, Jim, yeah, Jimmy, yeah, yeah Jim, crazy. The, the guy with the, yeah. the guy with the mini donkey cruising around yeah. set all the time i don't know what the i told oh, you about. oh right? yeah what's what's up with a mini donkey that's a new thing now <laughs> people are having a, a an emotional support donkey it's, it's actually, one. this one's a rescue right yeah yeah he straight up rescued it <laughs> they were gonna kill it and he was like i'll take it and, i mean jimmy's jimmy like here's the funny thing about jimmy and i'll say this because this guy is a wild man like if you look up his imdb every cool oh, yeah. movie like 
the steady he, cam stuff. Yeah. He he's he's the guy that invented that basically. All the steady cam stuff over the years. Like uh-huh. he did I'll, I'll find his uh, IMDb. Hang on a sec. So so here's a funny story that that listeners may appreciate. So we were doing this act or sorry, this action scene. I forget the director was a new director to our show. And uh, and and Jimmy's like pitching this uh, this scene and the way he wants to shoot it, and they were like, ah, I don't know, blah blah blah. And Jimmy, Jimmy's old school. He's like, well, you know, let me tell you, um, I did it uh, years ago on a little film called Heat. Yeah, that that that, that final scene, yeah. or not the final scene, but the gun, the shootout in the street. Yeah, that's he, his he was work. The, he he was a steady cam operator yes. on the downtown gunfight. Man, but, well, well, look, here's the thing about steady cam. It, it's so heavy and hot no one wants that job so if you're great at it you can work forever and that's what oh, i no. i tell people man if you're a young filmmaker out there find a niche that no one else is doing or wants to do and you can make a lifetime career out of it and make a shit ton of money i mean that was 25 oh. years ago yeah heat yeah. you can imagine how big the goddamn camera was back then. oh dude <laughs> oh, that's crazy well he, he also did i mean Dances with Wolves, freaking Abyss, <clears throat> Titanic. He's the steady cam operator. Chronicles of Riddick, Crash, The Negotiator, uh, yeah, Longmire, Southland. If he did Shameless. Dances with Wolves, uh, do me a favor, Tyler. Uh, ask him if Kevin Co- if he saw Kevin Costner's dick in it. Um, <laughs> if you don't, I, I'll, I'll ask Jimmy. Jimmy will tell me. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So Costner has wanted to put his dick. Is it's his dream <clears throat> to put his dick in a movie, and it's been cut out of eight films. So ask Jimmy if when he was working on it, like, hey, man, was there a scene mm. in which because I heard there was one cut out of Dancing with Wolves where you saw his dick? Yeah, I'll ask him. Yeah, I'll, L- I'll ask him. Listen He's, to this uh, this list of fucking movies. I mean, it's ridiculous. It, this it's guy. It's insane. Uh, let's see. Field of Dreams. OK. People, Costner. People K. Cost, it. dude. So he knows Costner well. He's seen his dick a bunch of times. He's had. I don't, to. I don't think there was a, <laughs> an opportunity in Field of Dreams for him to hang dong at all. But well, you remember when the kid uh, was choking on the hot dog? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you just like the doctors giving him CPR and his pants over to Kevin Costner. He's got no pants on. His he's got no on. pants on and his dick's in a bun. Um, <laughs> he's just like that. Uh, he, just comes, he just comes out of the corn. And yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> so Field of Dreams. I don't know where my pants went. Field of Dreams, the abyss. Uh, Young Guns 2, Predator 2, Oof. Uh, The Doors movie, wow. um, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Point Break, JFK, Fox Sneakers, A Few Good Men, <laughs> Falling Down. This is steady cam wow. operator jobs. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. The Getaway, True Lies, Casino, Clueless, uh, Damn. Heat, LA Confidential, Titanic, The Negotiator, Runaway Bride. I mean, I don't. And, He's like the Roger Deakins of steady cam. Any given Sunday, Gone in 60 Seconds. Swordfish, yeah, he, the Fast and the Furious original movie, Rush Hour two. I mean, no, so we, on we and so it. forth. He, this dude is fucking incredible. It. So he's, you know, but but again, but but going back to going back to Dan's point, that guy, yeah, that guy, you know, and he, David's directing. David's freaking, you know, been in t- literally on TV for twenty five years. Mm-hmm. You're talking about David Boreanaz, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, Boreanaz, yeah. and and but the two of them are like, all right, like, and they're listening to the input for you know how to get this as authentic as possible that's why the show is what it is is because guys like that and, and and many more don't get me wrong but to use dan's example like they're listening and they're they're it's a, cr- a collaborative process obviously as you know um and the fact that they're willing to listen with the amount of fucking massive experience that they have um when you combine those two things uh you you, you get a show that is still a good drama but has that level of authenticity where you're like, oh, why is it there? It's because they those guys have listened and 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 made it a priority and inserted that authenticity into their vision. Yeah, it's it's a great show, man, and and you guys do it right every single week. And we had uh, we had one of your bros on last week, one of your beef fries, AJ Buckley on oh, the AJ. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and okay. his. So uh, he's a little- He's a little, he's a little too sane for my taste. Little <laughs> and had more of a spark, but, but you know, whatever. We're all different people. <laughs> uh, he was telling us that you guys got <laughs> clipped for the coronavirus. Like you had one more episode to complete, and that was it. Um, have you heard any info about you guys getting picked up for the next season yet, or is everything kind of on a standstill? I, I mean, in in my opinion, we don't know anything. I I, I think that. Um, in my opinion, I, I think even this is so unprecedented. Obviously, worldwide, worldwide, everyone knows that. But mm-hmm. like, I think 
every industry is still kind of like, oh shit, what do we do? So I, I don't even think, I don't even think the studio knows. I don't think anyone knows. I think they're figuring out, um, you know, what's happening, how it's going to happen timeline. So I don't know anything, but I would argue, I don't even think the, the people that are supposed to know, know right now that that's my two cents. Yeah, because when you look at a TV show and you try to take social distancing into effect, it's not possible. It's, not possible. it's, it's no. impossible. So I don't know how, how fast you can get back to work, especially on a big network show. Um, I know a couple of my friends, uh, actor-wise and director-wise, behind the scenes, have gotten calls from studios saying, hey, man, do you have like a smaller independent film where you can use I, a... I've, I've heard the same thing. Yeah. Skeleton like, crew. Yeah, yeah, a drama. Yeah. You know, no action scenes where people are rolling around knocking each other out. Um, that, that we can maybe knock out for a low budget in, say, uh, in a, you know, a Georgia or an Alabama or a Utah. Um, they, yeah. they want to avoid... Yeah. yeah. They, they want to avoid California and New York, obviously, because those, yeah. those are the two big hot spots. So... Um, I think you're, I, yeah, I think you're right. I don't, I, I don't think the studios know yet. And you, can, you can make that movie lock. Remember Tom Hardy movie where he's in the car the whole goddamn time. Oh yeah. yeah. On the phone. <laughs> yeah. It's just, him, it's just him on the phone with his wife and the general contractor, the whole movie. Yeah, re- remake that. Remake phone booth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> with Colin Farrell. <laughs> yeah. Or the Blair Witch Project. You can make that. Yeah. You can make the Blair Witch Project. Um, yeah. But that's, that's kind of what they're looking for. And like the big budget productions you guys are on. I'm not sure when they come back. I will say this. The good news from it, after talking to AJ last week, it, it got me thinking after the show. And I was like, you know, usually you have a pilot season that takes place um, from January up until May. And you have yeah, upfronts they got, in May. They, they got nuked. Yeah. Yeah. They, they got nuked. So the, the shows that were on the bubble that you were going to cancel will probably get picked up for another season just because they have nothing. And then they know that they can go in. Call it a day, and then you know it's a plug and play. Yeah. Yep. Try yeah. to try to come back next. You definitely year. can't take a chance on a whole new lineup. That would be crazy. No, and, and well, they, they don't even. But they don't even have. They don't the have it. exactly. Yeah. yeah. But even if they had it, even if they had that shit, you couldn't. Like no, no network is going to just like ah, we're starting all fresh. Like no, you're not. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, I, look, uh, Hollywood's in a bit of disarray. I mean, unless you're on a, a TV series right now. The rest of it's kind of a mess. There's an actor stri- or a writer strike going on right now between the writers and their agents. Um, that still hasn't the WGA. Well, yeah, it's not a strike. They were gonna officially strike. That didn't happen. So it's but it's still a weird. Uh... Well, they had to. They fired all their agents, and that was what yeah. was asked for. So now you have all these writers that don't have agents. Um, they're trying to negotiate. That deal fell apart last night. Um, you had trolls too. Mm. That uh, went straight to video on demand, and they were they were waiting to see the numbers for that. They came out this morning. It made a hundred million dollars on video on demand in one day. Uh, f- for the it's been out for a week, a week and a half, and it's not that bad. It is already past the first movie, which was in theaters. That that's crazy too. So that I mean, but but you know what though, Ross, I would argue that this this whole coronavirus at least for hollywood i'm talking specifically to hollywood Mm -hmm. you know everything's changing so quickly and this is just one more level this is just exacerbating that change yeah um you know like the the old network like the way cbs nbc abc it's just like somebody was explaining to me about who our competitors were and they're like well they're 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 a different network they're not a network show so that we're not competing with them and i'm like well (laughs) Do you think when a kid pulls up a, a channel, do you think they know what's cable and what's network? If it's all streaming, oh, yeah. yeah, they don't know. It's they just have whatever, no idea. It's whatever they app they're pushing. It's the yeah. content. The content yeah, is they king now. They mm-hmm. don't care. Everything's competing with everything mm-hmm. because no one's equating what it's to. And which is actually, you know, it's interesting too. The 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 problem I have now is, you know, like I mean, you know, Ross, how our show works. Like every day that we're working on the show we're editing the last couple writing the next couple yep. and prepping the next one every single day so whereas when you know you do like a cable show you'll write all 10 episodes prep pretty much most of those episodes and then go film them back to back to back mm-hmm. they're already done <laughs> um so you know, a network show is very interesting in that you don't know what's going to happen in three episodes. So a lot of time you're going back and having to fix things because you didn't or not fix it, but you didn't know, Oh man, if we would have like, sometimes I'll give you an example with gear or uniforms, I'll, you know, 
like we'll pick a uniform for this episode because it makes sense. But then this episode connects to this one, but I didn't know what this one is. So then we're yeah. sitting there I'm like, oh man, this just is the wrong camo or the wrong gear. It just doesn't make sense, but you don't know uh, because the train moves that quickly. Um, but it, where I was going with that is people don't understand that process. And even though that process ties you to your creative, when it's up on a screen, people just see a list of channels. Mm -hmm. yep. They don't see a, a list of processes. Um, and so I think it, it really uh, weights everything differently uh, on, on what you're able to, to do and, and how different shows, um, you know, how, what, how you're getting those end products is, is from the process, but no one ever sees it. So and you guys do, you guys do 10 month shooting rotations. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Between nine and 10 months, nine and a half, 10 months. Yeah. And that's for people that don't know. That's like, I mean, it depends on your level of activity on the show, but you're talking minimum of 10 hours a day, probably minimum. Yeah. And then five days a week for, mm -hmm. for 10 straight fucking months. Yeah. Yeah, you have no life. I'm surprised Boreanis wanted to do it, to be honest with you. He's been on TV for 30 years, and he's been – every series has gone like 200 episodes yeah. for that guy. And it's right. like he immediately jumped off of Bones, which was on for 40 seasons, and then into this, which you guys are in your third or fourth. And it's like you ever sit down and talk to him and be like, man, aren't you exhausted? I mean, it was Angel, Buffy, Bones, SEAL Team. Like, I, I spend a lot of time with David – you know, very, uh, you know, close with them, you know, in the show. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of time to talk and it's funny cause yes, I have asked him dozens of times and his, um, it, it, I'll tell you a story cause it's actually really funny. Um, he actually was approached to be on the show, uh, first, mm -hmm. or I don't know first, don't quote me on that, but like he was approached to be on the show. It was literally, I think, a couple days after Bones ended, I, I don't know exactly, but like Bones had just, just, just ended. They said, hey, do you want to be in this pilot? And he said no. Because he had just got done 11 seasons of Bones, not, you know, including Buffy coming and just Angel. Yeah. Angel just <laughs> off He's of done Buffy. 500 so, episodes. Seasons. I mean, fuck, that's insanity. So, um, so he's like, no. And then, uh, and, and let's be honest, he doesn't need the money. No, obviously. not at all. So, so so he see so he gets off that and he's like no so they cast another actor i won't say who filmed with that actor well so it was like two weeks later and then we filmed with that actor for a week um and then due to creative issues between the the higher ups um they wanted to replace that actor it was Whoopi goldberg right if i'm not mistaken uh, no, no, no. It was, um, uh, it was actually Fred Savage. But that's it was Fred Vern Savage. Troyer. Uh, looks a little out of place. Can but. you imagine fucking Midget Seal? How fucking funny that would be. That would be an yeah. awesome, awesome episode. Midget Seals, dude. Yeah, look, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to ruin uh, the, the end of the last episode of the season. So. <laughs> that's um, the big reveal. <laughs> no, but basically they, um, they, they went back to him. And then he said, yes. Really? And now here's the funny part. So, you know, I started talking to David. And I'm like, so what, you know, like what changed your mind? Long story short, he's like, well, I had three weeks off and I got bored. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and But that's why, that's how he is. He needs about three weeks off. And I'm the same way. So I totally understand it. But he had three weeks off and he was just like, I miss working. I like work. And, and the thing about David, he's been on, tv for whatever it is 25 30 years consistently mm -hmm. because he likes hard work you know and and the other misconception ross you, i know you know this like acting it may not seem like it on on when you watch it on tv uh, but it's hard work man it's mm -hmm. not easy um <laughs> and, and it's it's it takes a lot out of you and and uh, uh he's been doing it for so long he's just a hard worker and and you know um yeah, Again, I, I, his success is directly attributed because of that, especially on a show like yours, because you have so much gear mm -hmm. and you're shooting in the heat of L.A. all the time that it's like, man, I bet you at the end of the days you're, you're exhausted. Uh, I mean, not somebody like you, obviously, like you were in actual war. Um, yeah, but, but for an actor, I actually I think it's probably more tiring now than it was then for you, because there's a lot of downtime. I am a lot older. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I'll tell you I'll tell you a story. And I actually I said I did some Instagram 
post that I comment on this, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it very clear. So uh, I did, I worked on um, uh, Suicide Squad for seven, I don't know, it was like six or seven months, whatever. And I wore a helmet for like 90% of the time. And I chose that. That was my choice. I was like one of the only idiots to wear a helmet. And it was a real fucking helmet. Looking back, I'm like, why <laughs> did I wear her? Like, how stupid was I to put this damn helmet? And you're in that gear all day long. So cut <laughs> to, I'm still as stupid, cut to the pilot of the show. Actually, the pilot, I think the first two episodes of season one. Uh-huh. I did all of it with a real helmet and real plates. Oh, so you're, you're stuck with that, right? No, no, no. But, but like, I was like, oh, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to fake everything. I'm going to do it for real. And then like episode four or maybe five of season one, I was like, you know what? This is just stupid. Like I'm wearing this gear all day long. Like I'm going to get shot. Like, so then I switched it out to, to fake weight plates. So they're, you know, they're, they're like plastic or whatever. Yeah. Dude, there's not a day that goes by that I look back and go, what the fuck was i thinking like that was the <laughs> dumbest <laughs> like and the thing is you can go at some point you just have to accept dude it's a tv show like mm, yeah you, you know when i have a backpack like you know i'm like dude take all the weight out of it why because i gotta run up this freaking mountain and you know the only person that's gonna know that i had 50 pounds in it is me is you, yeah. gonna, so, you know <laughs> um so but it goes back to it's like dude i've I don't have anything to prove to myself. Like, make it as light as possible. It, and it, the the reality though is, it makes your job easier. Yeah. Um. And that's and that's the key. So I get why, um, you know, it's it's one of those things. You know, granted, there's that like when people don't put anything, and you can tell like everything's flopping around. It's like, okay, now now you're affecting like you're taking me out of the story. Um. But that's that's my fake plate. To, yeah, I don't run with any weight now. See, don't you it. heard it here first, kids. Tyler Gray, not a method actor. <laughs> not a method no. actor. Well, he did spend a number of years in the actual military. Yeah, well, you know, you, you look, if you're not doing it for real on TV, brother, does it really count? Um, no. Well, that's the thing is, like, now, you know, you just got to smarter, not harder at this point. Exactly. I, I was smarter when I was younger, and now I'm smarter. Uh, let me ask you this. Speaking of method actors, since you were on Suicide Squad, um, there was a rumor that Jared Leto did that entire thing, Method. A hundred percent true. Oh, that's really annoying. Because that hundred percent true. Tell that, people how <laughs> annoying that is. Because I, I fucking hate it. He to did the a bunch of fucked degree. up shit, right? Yeah, he did, he did a, a ton of shit. But you, you would know more than I. Like he was sending the cast like dead snakes and. Yeah, yeah. I think a dead, uh, dead mouse or uh, I forget, dead rat or something. Um, you know, honestly, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't have. Uh, I wasn't around him a lot. I was in one scene with them, actually. Uh, it was really cool. So so the scene where they're in, you can't see it because I'm wearing a gas mask, but the scene where they're in the, uh, he's in her prison cell, mm-hmm. I'm the one who opens the door for him and I'm standing right there. Uh, so they're have, so I'm listening to this whole conversation, but, um, which was amazing, the improv they went on. But anyways, the, uh, yeah, I also... <laughs> I'll never forget. It was funny. We were like in the back of, it was when we blow into the, um, when we blow into the prison to rescue her mm-hmm. and on the back. And he's as Joker. He's like, all right, guys, we're going to make entry. Let's go boys. We're looking for a blonde. She's easy <laughs> on the eyes. And you know, he's just going off in character. Um, but he wasn't like, he was in character, but he wasn't like over, you know what I mean? He wasn't yeah. like, you know, like you could tell that he was him, but overtly he was projecting. But the thing is, and it was my first experience seeing something like that. But the thing is, because he was never Jared, I and again, I get it. Because he was never Jared, when he came into the room as the Joker, mm-hmm. because you didn't meet Jared. I remember one scene watching it. Everyone was so fucking nervous because they had no idea what he was going to do. And I remember walk, watching that and going, that's what he wanted. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's what he wanted. He wanted to create this 
I'm going to take away any comfort by you knowing me personally. And I want to make you nervous just being around the character because that's all I am. It was really interesting. Uh, it was really interesting. Yeah, because I'm, I'm sure if you walked off of that set at the end of it, you, you probably don't know who Jared Leto is. So if people asked you, you'd be like, eh, I don't, I don't really know that fucking oh, guy. I, I mean, I, I never saw him, like, I, I never saw him be himself one time. And again, I mean, I, he wasn't there that that often. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, that was, that was, I learned a shit ton on that film. It was a great experience. Um, I can honest honestly say, like, what you couldn't like some of the stars couldn't be any bigger and you couldn't be nicer people. Um, like all, all the big names that you'd expect, you know, like, Oh, you know, those huge, couldn't be nicer. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a, a lot of fun uh, just being able to be a part of that. That's awesome, man. Um, what else did you do prior to that? And anything else that was cool like that? Cause like, I, I feel, I feel like being on a set like suicide squad, especially for how long it is, you get to see everything that, that goes into a filmmaking process from front to back. And I always encourage people, I'm like, look, man, if you're going out there, just be a fucking extra if you can, because you'll never get that type of training in a class, you know, any classroom. I don't, I don't care if you go to NYU or whatever, wherever you go. Yeah. Uh, being on a set, you really can't replicate that anywhere. Uh, did you do anything no, else you, besides Suicide Squad? Yeah. Yeah, but but you're right. You you, you got to see the logistics of, of how it's made, and, and and anything you are on that allows you to see that process. Um, yeah. So the first movie I worked, so as soon as I got out, literally, um, and this is super fucking ironic, but I'll mention it. Um, the first project I did was, which is so ironic, was a Pat Tillman. Um, it was like a docu. I don't know what it was called, but it was basically an episode on like the history channel mm -hmm. on Pat Tillman, on what happened. And they came to me and I was kind of like, dude, I like, I felt guilty. I didn't really want to do it. But at the same time I was like, well, if not me, then who I was at least in, like, I, I at least knew Pat Tillman, not well by any, you know, I had fucking five conversations with him, but I was like, and I was in second range of time. So I was like, okay, I at least, I feel confident to do this because if not, you know, they'll get somebody that has no connection with that, that unit or, or whatever. So that was the first thing I did. Um, then I did a movie called snitch, uh, with Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. Uh, I was the, the tactical advisor on that. And I had, that was actually my first acting gig, which is actually a very funny story. Um, so I'll, I'll tell it, but uh, yeah. How is, so how's the rock? How is he? I, I mean, <laughs> again, uh, I put I put uh, uh, Will Smith and Dwayne Johnson in the same category, in that they are they're like motivating big personalities, uh, like you know what what we know. Mm -hmm. But then like meet them and actually talk with them and spend time with them, they're actually much better even than their persona. Like mm -hmm. they're even more cool, more motivating, super super philosophical and just. Like they're just giants of personality, uh, but but even more so, uh, they're just smart people. Like Will is super smart. Like Dwayne is is he's very quiet, reserved, and he's he's just he's a very smart, thoughtful, motivating human. And uh, I don't know how uh, he has uh, time left in the day to do anything after having to eat either. ten to twelve thousand goddamn calories. Man, yeah. Jesus Christ! I don't know, like. <laughs> when I worked on that film, it was kind of before he took off on the, like, just working, like, constantly, mm -hmm. constantly. I, I don't know how he does it. Like, you know, it's it, 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 Dwayne Johnson now is similar to me of, like, Ryan Seacrest. Um, and I'm going to throw a conspiracy theory out there because I think Ryan Seacrest is actually uh, triplets. <laughs> I think there's three of them. And I think they split the load. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's no way it's one person. It's not possible. Like, so. uh, like that movie with Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman about magicians. Oh my god! Yeah, it's so weird you said that. Yeah. The Prestige. The prestige. prestige. Yeah. I, yeah the prestige. I, dude, I haven't <clears throat> thought about that movie I in I ten watched years. It two weeks ago. Dude, I I, I just I brought it up like on Ross Patterson Revolution earlier. M multiplicity with uh, Michael Keaton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ryan Secrets clones himself. Basically, what? there's. I'm telling you, he invented cloning, and there's three of them. But all, um, all we can do is kidnap him and see what happens. Yeah, if yeah. He, if he it keeps happens. producing content, it'll be like Saddam Hussein. There'll be another <laughs> video. Like, 
Um, he has the gnarliest no, schedule of all time, by the way. Who, Saddam Hussein? No. Uh, he's dead, so he's got uh. all, the, all the time in the world. But um, uh, Seacrest, he flies back and forth to do the, the Kelly and Ryan show to New York and then flies back to do American Idol in L.A. Um, I, be- I bet he was stoked when the quarantine happened because they're all doing it from home now. So yeah, now, because yeah. he was going on just overnight flights back I and m- forth. Be like, and again, which, you know what, by the way, Russ, I think you'll appreciate this. I think there's something, I think there's a topic that we should bring up now. Yeah. Is it about how Bert Koontz hasn't given you those boots yet? Oh, fuck you, dude. Is that it? <laughs> no, it's not. Oh, it's no, not. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. no. The, the topic is, this is a Hollywood lesson. This is a Hollywood lesson. And this is actually a life lesson. The life lesson is there's no such thing as justice in this world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you're saying yes, and uh, we all agree on this, but here's the proof. Ryan Seacrest, how big is he right now? Fuck. M- mega. How much is he worth? Who knows? It's in the you know nine digits, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so, does anyone remember the original other co-host of American Idol? I do. I do. Uh, I don't. Brian Dunkelman is his name. Damn it, Ross. Only you would know that. Well, I, look, I, I, that is a classic tale of like, Holy shit, man. You had one guy go on to make close to a billion dollars. He'll probably eclipse it, and I would say two two years. He'll, he'll, he'll eclipse a billion dollars with a B. And then Dunkelman, who has made about $80. $80. Um, oh, oh, but, but do you know what Dunkelman does now? No. I have no idea what he does now. Dan, 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 can you, do you mind looking it up real quick while we... Uh... <clears throat> Is he hosts an open mic at the Ha Ha Ho? Hold on, I'm looking. So now, now, for those that don't know what happened... There were two hosts of the original American Idol. Mm-hmm. There were Brian Dunkelman and Ryan Seacrest. Uh, Brian Dunkelman was actually, and he's he was a comedian. Yeah. Brian Dunkelman was the personality host. Yeah. Seacrest was like the good-looking host. <laughs> I, I mean, tell me I'm wrong. He had no personality at the time. He was like a sub. He was just kind of there. He's like, mm, look at me. And yep. Brian Dunkelman was like, joke, 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 boom, 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 right? So Dunkelman... Now, here's what happened. Dunkelman basically sees the American Idol thing and goes, they're not treating these people right. They're forced to sign contracts before they even come on the air. And I don't agree with this. I think they're getting screwed over. So I'm making a stand to stand up for these people. <clears throat> right? Yeah. Well, and right now American he's, uh, let's like, see. See you later. What, so, right? so, so, so before Dan says, yep. so he makes a stand. They kick him off the show later. Seacrest goes on. So what we all know Seacrest doing, what's Brian Dunkelman doing now? It seems like he's doing a number of things, including driving for Uber. Is he really? Yeah. He's an Uber driver. Shit. That's side that's hustle. hustle. That's one of them. It's a nice side hustle. He's also though. like a fucking uh, a docent or some shit. Mm-hmm. Like the announcer of Family Feud Live Celebrity Edition, which is a tour-oriented version of the popular TV game show. Yeah, because Steve Harvey hosts the real one on, yeah. t- on TV. Yeah. Um, and then there's some no, other so- shit. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yikes. The other shit is just like stand up comedy and, and, uh, yeah, he's always been a stand up comedian. But the point, and again, nothing, <clears throat> you know, nothing wrong with being an Uber driver. I, I think it's actually a great venue that's allowed a lot of people to do a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like, that's what, like, at a certain level, like, there's no justice. And when you stand up for <laughs> justice to a certain degree and put your foot down, like, I'll tell you right now, a billion dollars that Ryan Seacrest has can buy a lot of justice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. Like, I always, a lot of people, especially in the vet community, not uh, certain veteran charities, for example. I'm not going to, well, I'm not going to give any examples on that one. But uh, a lot of people feel weird about using their veteran status or first responder status or whatever the fuck it is to to market and sell their company or their, themselves as a brand. I'm like, no, dude. The more money you make, the more you can give back to your tribe. That's that's what you're fucking supposed to be doing. Fuck what everybody yeah. else thinks. Tell their story yeah. in a good way. Make like take all the money from the outside world and pour it back in your community. Like that's what you can do. Yeah, man. I, and and you know we hear it all the time when we have guests on the show of like, why did you have so and so on, man? He he wrote a fucking book and did a movie or whatever, and was like, he should do that. You know, like what's what's wrong with telling your story and get it out there? That's going to help way more people than it is going to hurt people. So, um, fuck, man. I, anybody who's got a problem with that, I don't understand it. 
Well, I, I would go, I would even go bigger than that. For me, it's like, I look at, if you're doing something to screw me over personally, okay, I'll take an issue with that. Like if somebody literally plagiarized something I wrote and posted as their own, okay. But if somebody's doing their own thing, like my opinions are relevant on it. Right. Like, let them do them. Like I think the biggest problem in our society now is, and again, I'm obviously, I don't mean that literally, but one of the biggest problems is everyone has an opinion on everything. And because we have social media, we have a forum to convey our opinions that everyone sees. Mm -hmm. And the fact is if your opinion doesn't have some kind of personal experience or effect, it's not important. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. So uh, to, to all these people out there, I mean, come on, man. Get fucked. Get, a, get fucked. Make your money. It's, it's hard enough to make money in this world. And Dunkelman, dude, he's a fucking Uber driver, you know? Yeah, dude, freaking make that. Make but, money. but it goes back to you're talking about a guy who fought for the little guy yeah. and the system screwed him. Like, you could fought, fight the system, but at a certain point, like, the system's going to beat you down. It's It hasn't changed. <laughs> it won't change. And the only way... To beat the system is to beat it from within. You have to be a part of the system, make your money, as Dan was saying, and then give it back uh, to, and again, I, I'm not a, this is what it is, but it, it's an Oprah quote, and I like it. Do what you have to do until you can do what you want. That's true. It's true. And she did Perfect. that. She pretended to be with Stedman until no one cared anymore. They're still together. Quote, unquote. Uh, Air quotes. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, this is the point in the show We got uh, some sponsors we have to read To keep this whole shit wagon on the air You have a ghost bed right. We got ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros you have a, Do you own a ghost bed? Uh, so, wait, a, a what? A ghost bed It's a, the finest mattress on the planet You've probably oh, slept no, on one Have you ever no stayed at any of Jared's houses Over the years? Uh, actually I have then But you... it's been a while She so probably didn't have one at Oh that yeah, we've, they've been a sponsor for a long time For a long time yeah. I feel like, yeah yeah, at some point you've you rested your dick on a ghost bed from ghostbed.com yeah, right. forward slash drinker bros. And right now you can rest your dick on one. 25% off everything in the entire store. Pillows, sheets, mattresses, adjustable bases, you name it. And as always, they got a 36-month pay-as-you-go program. No interest at ghostbed.com. So if you're quarantining, you might as well do it in comfort. Uh, I don't believe in the quarantine. Never have, never will. And I won't mask up. When you say you don't believe in it, you don't believe that it exists? No. I Look, I, I feel that I've had it. I've moved on. And uh, I do what I want. I got a little sunburn today. You know? I've been going to the beach every day drinking Trulies like a little Truly girl. Woo! <laughs> I, I'm, I'm confused. Is, 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 is the quarantine a sponsor? <laughs> no, it, it could be. At this point, it could be for everything everyone's doing. Uh, next up, we've got KillCliffCBD.com. This is the best shit on the planet. Yep. Uh, love, love KillCliffCBD.com. Uh, three amazing flavors, the grape, the orange kush, and the mango. I am a, I'm a grape guy, dude. I'm the grapest of all time, and I drink it religiously. It's my dad's birthday. I'm going to give a big Jer, Jerry Lowry, a shout out. It's on Thursday, April 30th. The only thing he asked for for his birthday, no lie, was two cases of KillCliff. And I was like, great. Not only did I order the cases, I used my own promo code, which was <laughs> Drinking Pros. I got 30% off of free shipping, and it went right to his house. I drink a can every day. You drink a can every day. Yep. And, uh, and now my dad does, uh, which is wild. Like, I think everybody's getting on the train where it's like before, but it was like, eh, what does CBD really do for you? Um, try it. Um, you will not piss hot. Mm. There is no THC in this. So if you're, if you're a military or first responder or whatever you do in this world that requires a drug test at your job, you will not piss hot. Go to KillCliffCBD.com today and get yourself a case. With that promo code Drinking Bros, that, that gives you 30% off and free shipping. Knocks it down to like two fifty dollars a can, dude. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, best in the biz. Last but not least, we've got DukeCannon.com. Love the Duke Cannon. Best body wash on the planet. Here it is, kids. Uh, if you're watching the show on YouTube, if not, subscribe to Drinking Bros Podcast on YouTube. Nine bucks for one of these big guys, and it lasts forever. Mm -hmm. All you need is about a dime size, quarter size, and it's the best smelling body wash in the business, and it is a veteran-owned company. Uh, so you are actually putting your money into a company that uh, is giving back. Uh, at the end of the year, they give away a certain percentage of their proceeds to veteran-owned charities and other companies businesses and uh, they got four amazing scents you're the naval supremacy guy yep. um i'm the old glory guy 
You can get one for nine bucks or uh, four for 30, and it'll last you, fuck, man, six months, man. It, it, it's amazing. Go to DukeCannon.com, promo code Drinking Bros, 15% off and free shipping. Tyler Gray, are you directing right now? Is that something you want to get into? Uh, I directed my first episode, uh, episode 10 on season three. And yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I want to do. That's what I've always wanted to do. Um, is that the path you want to go down now after the show's over? Like, uh, I think you'd be great at it, man. I, I, I love it. It was, it was honestly the most fun I've ever had, uh, doing anything like, I mean, military is a separate thing. Um, but it, it was, it's, I mean, obviously, you know, mm-hmm. but it was just, like, it was so, I'm massively ADD and there was so much going on. It was perfectly wired to my ADD and I just, I loved it. I had so much fun. Um, I like being on camera as well. And, and again, I'm, I know I'm preaching the choir here. For me, being on camera is fun. I, any part of storytelling I like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for me, being on camera really helps me as a director uh, as well. So they all kind of, each different, piece that you do gives you more information and reveals more of the puzzle and how to do a better job on each other. So you're saying uh, being on camera helped you understand directing more. Can you give an example? Like, is there any concrete example that stands out? Yeah. And again, I, I, you know, when I say this, obviously Ross has done this for a lot longer than I have, but it, 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 here's an interesting thing. Like every single thing that you do on camera, and this is for the audience, uh, you know, every single thing you do is, is fake. You're making it up. Like, you know, it's like you're, you're in a, uh, 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 the kitchen cooking, like every single thing you do is fake. You have to make it up. And if you cross over to here, that affects camera and mm-hmm. light and like, so it's all very much a, a balance of like, you can't just do whatever you want to do. It doesn't work that way. Right. And so where I'm going with that is, when you're in a scene and a director's never been on camera, like I've had directors be like, all right, you know, you know, just, uh, you know, do what you want. And you're like, but nothing, <laughs> everything I'm doing is fake. Like, you know, you realize being on camera, like if you want me to do something, if you have a look, if you have something nuanced, like what you want to see, you got to tell me or I'm not going to do right. it. Um, and you just, I learned to communicate better what I wanted to actors. Cause I've been in scenes where I'm like, I don't really know, you know, you're just standing there with your hands up next to your face. Cause you're not sure what to do with your hands the whole time. <laughs> well, you, know, I mean, you, you make it up. Like you learn, okay. Uh, you know, I need to occupy myself. I need to do all these things. But as a director, the director is seeing the whole episode mm-hmm. and, and all the little pieces. So every little nuanced thing, like they have to manufacture that. Um, and, and some, and, and really good directors will, will give those nuanced direction, uh, that nuanced direction of like, you know what, clock this when you're coming over, or I need to see a reaction of somebody saying something. You'd be like, you know, the, the easiest, you know, because of the script, what the words that you need to say are, but the words are the lowest form of storytelling, in my opinion. The, the stuff, if you think back at a movie, the shit that you really are like, dude, that was badass, isn't just somebody saying something. It's exactly how they said it. It's right. their tone. It's their breaks. It's their look that they gave with it. It's their body language. Yep. Um, and all that stuff is manufactured. Right. And um, there's no... Gonna really reinforced that and taught me that. Right. Yeah, there's no room for expositional dialogue in, in a film. Like when there's video, it's one thing if there's a if it's a book novel or something and you're trying to explain what a, a scene looks like. Mm-hmm. But if if you walk out into a balcony as an actor and like, wow, the sun really looks nice today, and then it pans over to the sun, like, wow, that's clunky and ham handed as fuck, dude. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is terrible story. Show the guy's face enjoying the sun, then show the sun, right, right, and then right. pan wide to show them both. That's how you do it. But that's a good note, though. I mean, it's like you can't do that ham handed bullshit and make stuff be credible. Everybody's going to be like, oh, yeah, it, some teenager it, shot this with their phone. It, it was like when I was watching um, uh, Back to the Future and some of the shots, I was like, oh, my God. Like, if you watch Back to the Future, somebody goes back and watches it. Generally, the camera generally stays in one position and the actor's blocking is based around coming into the camera because the camera at that time was very hard to move. Right. Mm-hmm. But what it makes... And again, these are the things that I nerd out on and, and I'm sure Ross does, but it's like 
the less, if you look at old films, like 80s, 90s, which is my jam, there was less cuts. And the reason there was less cuts is because the camera weighed a bajillion pounds, lighting weighed a bajillion pounds, and it took time to move all that shit. Mm -hmm. So they figured out creative blocking to where everything could stay in place. Now the camera can move all over the place. So it's like cut, 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 cut. And you're like, I, dude, I don't even know what's going on. Watch Die Hard. Yeah. Tell me a time in Die Hard. You don't know exactly what's going on, where everyone is. Tell me you're not spatially aware of everything. Um, whereas now you get into a fight in a movie and you're like, uh, dude, I just threw up because so it was you, cutting so The you, Matrix changed that yeah, uh, as you, far as the fight game Do goes. you think that films are like a victim of technolo technology success in that way? Like, is it is it become more overproduced and not as good in that in that regard? Because I see, like, there there have been times where actors didn't do what they were supposed to do, uh -huh. and because of that, the fight scenes were heavily cut. Like uh, the Iron Fist, that dude that played one of the fucking he was on Game of Thrones. I don't remember his name, but then he was on the Marvel Iron Fist movie or show, and he didn't show up or he couldn't. Maybe I don't know what the fuck it was but they didn't get the choreography down. Mm -hmm. So most of the fight scenes, and it's primarily a superhero fight movie, most of the fight scenes that involve him are super quick cuts of stuff. Right. Because he didn't know what the fuck he was doing, right? And it it, it was the biggest critique of the entire series. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's uh, a lot of it has to do with what Tyler was talking about with technology and the way that it's changed mm -hmm. um, on, on two fronts. Uh, first of all, back in the day, like Back to the Future is a perfect example, right? Everything was shot on film too, so oh yeah, they couldn't see the, they couldn't see it, couldn't see it. So you didn't have you didn't have playback and, and all that stuff, and you had to go and you know ship it out to a chem lab, get that back. You would see it in the in the dailies days later, sometimes a week later, and it was uh, done. And it, it was, already happened, and, and it was expensive. Um, you know, there was like nine guys who were in charge of those film canister, canisters and all that stuff. So you wanted to to block it out more and uh, use a lot of one takes and all that other shit. Um, it was also a, a stylistic choice of that time where everybody wanted to be like Martin Scorsese and, you know, oh, great, we're going to go through the, the thing and do it all in yeah. one take, and that's going to be amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the other regard that it has changed over the years is kids in video games. When you see, you know, fight scenes and first-person shooter games and all that other shit, like, you want to see it now as you've grown up with it, where it was like, all right, shit, I want these quick cuts and I want these quick deaths and shots and all that other stuff. And it's going to happen. Bam, 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 bam. Because everybody's got <clears throat> such ADD now that it's like, man, I've been playing video games my whole life. I don't understand why the movie's not moving as fast. Um, same with sports. Yeah. yeah. I wonder how many, I wonder how many weird places in sports. And uh, I wonder what the average uh, cut length is for uh, the John Wick movies. Like how many? Well, how much of that is he you, doing at one time? If you look, um, my buddy actually, who's an editor, he has a breakdown of of, of cuts per film, mm -hmm. and uh, films now are like four times. And I mean, don't quote me exactly, yeah. but like four times more cuts than you know films. Uh, you know, ten years ago, twenty years ago, mm -hmm. um, it, it's just they cut more. And, and the thing is, it's that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I just think it's for me, you know, every director, you know, or every film, you know, cinephile, uh, which don't get weird on me. That's people who love film. Yeah. Just and they also they well, they fuck a movie, too. So, um, you know, it's people who put their dick inside of film as well. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Which which was a lot easier when it was 35 millimeter. Now with digital, you get jammed up in the hard drive. Really hurts. But really hurts. Um, the, the, the chase chase. But the point being is it's like. You know, I like um, I, I, I like my style. Eighties and nineties. I mean, those movies were just the best, unbelievable. And and I, what I want to do is like my dream is to kind of make something. I eventually want to make something that is current, but has that same um, Die Hard type. And the other thing too is go back with action movies. A great, I'll give you a great example about Die Hard. Everyone. Part of the other reason of quick cuts is everyone wants to be a badass now. Mm -hmm. Watch Die Hard. Bruce Willis got the shit kicked out of him in almost every fight. Right. Well, Jackie Chan did that his entire career. Yeah. He, Jackie Chan is known for losing ninety five percent of the fight, then winning yeah. winning the last five. Well, you have to root. You have to have a hero to root for. Yeah. Where you take Fast and Furious, and I don't know if you read that article, but 
Um, there is a thing in the contract where Vin Diesel and The Rock are counting how many times each of them got punched, and it has to even out in the edit. And there is someone on set from each camp that is counting how many punches the other one is taking and or kicks, and they don't want to look like the, the non-badass of the movie. That franchise is a goddamn nightmare to shoot now. And uh, Jason I, Statham had to do the same. He did the same thing, and it was just like, come on, man. Statham in real life is about 5'2". I'll, t- I'll tell you a very sad, one of my Hollywood mess-ups. So here's, here's learn from me. This is a big Hollywood <laughs> mess-up. So, the, the director, and I'm, I'm classic, like I say stupid shit all the time. Um, and this is an example of that. So I'm working on um, uh, Suicide Squad uh, with some SEALs, uh, Kevin Vance and, and Nate Brown, great, great dudes. Um, and, uh, and, and David Ayer, who is the writer director of suicide squad. Mm -hmm. Now, if people don't know, David Ayer is a Navy veteran. He was a submariner. Mm -hmm. Um, he actually wrote U five, seven, one while on a submarine serving. Really? Uh, Yes. Yeah, he did. He's, he doesn't, you know, well, David actually doesn't talk generally at all in general. Uh, he's just a very cool guy. Uh, but yeah yeah he um yeah he wrote which actually i think he was probably a very quiet guy before he became a submariner and then that made him more quiet (laughs) anyways point being is navy vet he doesn't talk about it but he absolutely is solid dude so anyways we're working on suicide squad you know he's writer you know he wrote training day i mean the guys he wrote and directed fury guys an animal an animal one of the most amazing writers i've seen and directors but so we're working on it and you know like Uh, At that time, Fat, I want to say, it was 2015, I want to say Fast 6 was, like, going to be released on Friday, and it was Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And me, like an absolute dumbass, was like, uh, yeah, hey, David, you know, you know, it it was something was going wrong. I'm like, well, you know, at least, you know, you get to look forward to some of that uh, Fast Fast and Furious residuals when Fast 6 comes out on, on Friday. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I don't, I don't get anything from that at all. <laughs> I don't know. I, I should have prefaced this. He wrote the original Fast and Furious. Yeah, you get nothing. So you, if you write. He, he if, wrote yeah. it. Created all the characters. Yep. Created the whole franchise. He wrote it. Um, he grew up in a very rough neighborhood in LA. I have no doubt it was based on a lot of people he knew his experiences. He sold the script and whatever the contract was, he gets nothing. And I was like, that's how it works. You know, when, it, when it's the first one, that's it. Unless you produce it. Uh, you know who all that money's actually going to on those, that franchise? Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel. He owns 30% of that movie and he makes, I heard. makes I like heard. 90 million a picture. That movie's made, or that series so far has made about $5 billion. Yeah. Yeah. By I, he's probably worth five or six hundred million. And I feel like David should be able to go out and murder somebody for five billion dollars. I mean, he's a, he's a, rich. Uh, he's David a, Ayers is fucking uh, yeah. rich yeah. for sure. But he he's should get fine. at least one kill. Yeah, yeah. you should get one for five billion goddamn dollars. Uh, maybe kill. Some, someone lot. argue. No, someone he, argue. Maybe he did. R.I.P. Paul Walker. You know? No, nailed it. Nope. Nope. Nailed it. Um, let me ask you this. Is there any books that you're reading like military wise that you're like, shit, man, I, if I get big enough, I would love to direct this and make this into a gigantic Hollywood feature film. Um, uh, Oh, well, I just got, uh, I just got the no ordinary dog book, which just came out on Friday, uh, uh, last Monday. It was this yeah. week. Yeah. Um, or last week. Yeah. Uh, there, he's actually going to yeah. be on the show. On, uh, I don't know what day, but we're recording Monday with him. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. That's right. Yeah, Will yeah. Cheese, uh, who no ordinary dog mm-hmm. is. Uh, he was the dog handler on the on the UBL target. Um, so, um, but far as directing one, um, by the way, you in, know, in Hollywood, if, a dog movie that you can sell that in about ten seconds, man. Um, there is a fo- uh, formula yeah. for it, and if there is a dog as the lead in your movie. You will get that green light ASAP. So I would reach out to him and be like, hey, man, <laughs> why don't you let me direct this? Because that's a surefire sale to a studio. Our, our, our highest rated character on SEAL team is the dog. <laughs> I told you, dude. <laughs> that's just because Justin Melnick never stops pimping his dog, though. Yeah, that, that's, that is true, too. No, um, I, you know, there's, there's – um, I'm trying to think of another book. Um, 
I mean, for me, there's so many great stories uh, out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I definitely look, I'll, I'll say straight up, like, our no one has made our platoon, um, you know, from, from our, you know, our generation. Why I, I do you think, think that is? Um, well, <clears throat> the short answer is it's too soon. Yeah, I think all the war fighters from the GWAT are still kind of processing their emotions over all that shit. To be honest, it's, it's, I mean, it's Platoon came soon. out in '86, right? And the Vietnam War ended in '72, so it's like that's 14 years after the war ended. Before the biggest movie about Vietnam, in my well, opinion, I mean, Deer Hunter was a big movie too, but this one was, the, you know, at the time, the movie about it, Vietnam. It's, it's got to be since 10 you guys years are, from the end. Yeah. So yeah. since you guys are both there, let me ask you: <laughs> Which story would it be? And what year would you guys focus on then? Since you guys are both over there's there. so many. I mean, yeah, like uh, the like Battle of Fallujah, the Battle of Ramadi, those are two that stick out. Uh, you know, they've yeah, made there have been movies made like the Twelve Fucking Horse. That that movie sucked, yeah. by the way. It's the worst that movie. I hate to talk shit because there's some actors in there that I like, but that is the worst military movie ever made. Twelve whatever the fuck not, it is. Not Hurt Locker. Twelve strong. That's it. No. Okay. Twelve strong is way worse than Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker is a close number two, I guess. But those are the two for sure. The big budget ones. Those are the two worst I've ever seen. Gotcha. Because there's everything they got wrong is so easy to get right. All they had to do was call him, yeah, or call <laughs> like Remy Adelke or any of these dudes that are fucking balls deep in that industry right now. There's right. so many of them. Yeah. Like there's no yeah. there's no excuse to get it wrong now, and they fucked it up as bad as you can fuck something up. Well, you, you know the the thing. I, so, I mean, the Fallujah's in it. I was I was there. Uh, I was in Fallujah in two thousand four when mm -hmm. it was uh, surrounded, um, and that was. I'll tell you a story about Fallujah. This is this this this. I don't tell a lot of these stories, but I'll tell this one because it's funny. Um, uh, maybe funny sounds the right word, but I was, <laughs> in, uh, I was in Baghdad and. Uh, uh, I was in Baghdad at the uh, um, in the green zone, and then we came out to Fallujah, and it was my first. And then we they were living in at this little house in Fallujah uh, on the Marine base called Mek, and <laughs> we had to go to like this. I don't even remember what it's called, but like this Marine base uh, base is the wrong word. A Marine outpost mm -hmm. that was literally on the edge of of the town of Fallujah or the city, whatever. And I remember going there, and it was like. I remember coming in, we were meeting with somebody and I remember the, uh, the Marine up on the Mark 19, I remember walking in and he was like, and I just remember being, and it's Mark 19. Yeah. And I remember being like, so that's how it is here. All right. Like, <laughs> Mark, Mark 19 is, is an automatic weapon that fires 40 millimeter grenades. It's an automatic <laughs> grenade launcher. Yes. It's not a gun. It's a fully automatic <laughs> grenade launcher. And you couldn't have at that time, you couldn't have a grenade launcher mounted on a vehicle driving through Baghdad because mm. there's no, it's just so destructive. Yeah. But I walked in there and he like let loose like 12, 16 rounds of 40 Mike Mike. And I was just like, <laughs> all right, things are different here. Like, you know, <laughs> it's, this is, it was war, like war, mm. war, like World War II type stuff. So, um, well, actually, actually, it's funny uh, that kind of segues me to one of one of my favorite war movies of all time. I I, I am going to argue that this is the best war movie ever made, it's and this is and, then, and there's many good ones, but I'll give my reasons why. Red Dawn. I'm kidding, uh, <laughs> dude. I fucking love Red Dawn. I know, so do I. I. In the <laughs> In the Army Now by Pauly Shore. That's Jared's favorite war movie. It is. And that's not surprising uh, to anybody. On, so. on that note, by the way, total side note, look it up. I swear it's true. Red Dawn is the first PG-13 movie ever. Oh, shit. Oh, no shit. All right. Yeah, yeah look Swayze? it up. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I rewatch it. There is no way in hell it would be PG-13 now. It's all Oh, uh, no, not at all. Yeah, yeah, it's an R. Um, yeah, but anyways, point being is Full Metal Jacket. Okay. I mean, it's basically two movies, though, right? That and... But that, that, if you think of it, Full Metal Jacket is the biggest, um, it's the only movie that's not a full, but it's a relatively full arc from transition to mm. war. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I like, think uh, 
it's either that or Apocalypse Now. Those are the Apocalypse only two. Now is my favorite. That's like that's, that's like in, in today's terms to me, that's like Jordan Kobe. Yeah, kind of situation. I don't yeah. think LeBron's in that conversation yet. No, no Apocalypse Now. But again, there, I I I agree. Apocalypse Now is amazing and as good. The only reason I give the edge to Full Metal Jacket because from a filmmaking perspective, adding those two things that really shouldn't work as seamlessly mm-hmm. as they do, mm-hmm. as you know, it shouldn't work as perfectly. It, it's two separate stories that should be two different movies in a way, but the fact that it works in one film is, it's almost impossible to do, you know? In the comments on YouTube, write your favorite war movie uh, Mm -hmm. in the comments below. I'm curious as as to what everybody uh, says on that. You remember that one that Clint Eastwood did when he he split it up? It was a World War II movie. Uh, Black Fathers? Yes. Uh, And he did the Japanese side of it, and then he did the American side of it. Which was genius, yeah. Yeah, uh, I feel like that guy, man. He's he's always doing, uh, or at least trying to do some cool veteran shit. Um, would, uh, would, it, would it be a dream to work with so him? You, I'm sorry, go ahead. Would it be a dream to work with him, Clint Eastwood? Oh, dude, Clint Eastwood is, uh, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, you know. Um, I do have a good story about Clint Eastwood, and I'm going to tell it because, um, and, and I hope Scott Eastwood, so Scott, I worked with Scott Eastwood mm-hmm. on, uh, on Suicide, Suicide Squad. Squad yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Scott told me this story, and uh, you know, hopefully he doesn't get upset with me for telling it, but it's pretty damn funny. I think he watches the show, so you got to be careful. Yeah, he's fine. Well, it's fine. Oh, I'm yeah, just yeah. kidding. No, no, Scott, <laughs> Scott's a really cool guy. But um, uh, so Scott tells me this story about, you know, he's like, I don't know, 16, 17, whatever age he was. And, um, you know, his dad, Clint Eastwood, gives him a car. Well, Clint Eastwood gave him, I forget the car, but it was like a 76 Pontiac. Right? <laughs> so he gets this, this 76 Pontiac, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, Scott gets it and he drives it for like a week. And it's something major, like the engine, like catastrophically failed, or it was something big. And, and this, to me, this kind of sums up the what our image of Clint Eastwood is. And it's like, so Scott calls him up. He's like, you know, hey, dad, the, uh, you know, the engine broke in the car and Clint Eastwood was like, it's your car. What the fuck are you calling me for? <laughs> that Classic. sounds about right. Classic Classic Classic. Clint like, here's a car, 76, you know, Nova or whatever it is. The engine goes bad. Like I, I gave you a car. It's your problem now. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's one of those things where um, I, I like that. Uh, if you listen to anything Clint Eastwood has ever said, ever done, um, I think he's just big about people taking ownership over. And, and that story was kind of like, he's all about, you know, basically uh, taking responsibility for, for your own actions, your own, you know, everything. And, uh, um, and as a filmmaker, I mean, he's an absolute animal uh, on every level. Yeah, and he's like 89 years old still yeah. making there's movies. A, there's a movie that Jared wants to do that I think he would be interested in. It's about the Ash Street shootout. Do you know that story from uh, from Washington State, Sega Ranger? Like, they they had a problem. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Dude, I've heard that story a yeah. hundred. It's wild as fuck. Like, there's an official story that's out, and it doesn't even come close to all the crazy. It's, it's one of those weird situations. Like, you take an event – like the Boston bombing, for example, mm-hmm. Mark Wahlberg made that movie. You have to like dramatize and church it up because anytime there's any kind of military action or police investigation, whatever it is, there's usually a lot of dead time. Right. Like there's a lot of hurry up and wait yeah. bullshit. This one is not one of those cases. This is this one is one where the actual story is way fucking crazier than the official story. Like it's you're, you're way crazy. The hilltop shootout in Tacoma. Yes. Yeah, dude, when I, so it's a funny story about that. So when I got to second range battalion, uh, I got there in 90, late nineties, 97, I mean, that wasn't too long after that shit, right? Wasn't it in like 92 uh, it was, or something? It was shit? like 91, I think yeah. 91, 92 around there, but you know, five years, whatever. But, but there was also no social media or anything. So That's it was true, like, yeah. I heard stories, but you really couldn't as a, like a private, I couldn't separate what was real right. or like, did it happen? <laughs> whatever. And then, like, as time goes by, like, more has come out, and then he's turned, holy shit, it's a true story. Yeah. It's crazy. It was in actually in 1989. Ah, 89. shit. Yeah. 
But it was, oh yeah, because it was after Panama. That's right. It's yeah. after Panama. It's all Panama veterans. Yep. Yeah. Right after they, they they deployed with like what the third brigade from the eighty second or some shit. I don't remember. No, who six, it was. Uh, all the range battalions deployed separately to, mm. uh, to and jumped into Panama. Actually, oh, that's they jumped right. straight. In. Yeah, it was a. Uh, um, actually, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. Uh, talking about movies and stuff, the invasion of Panama. That's a hell of a story. Freaking uh, the invasion of Grenada, like some crazy stuff happened in both of those that you don't really hear about. Um, they've never made movies about them. Well, um, but, Heartbreak Ridge kind of touched on yeah, the Heartbreak Grenada Ridge, thing. True. That's the only Heartbreak one. Ridge was based I love on, Heartbreak but Ridge. But it wasn't like a whole, it wasn't about the Grenada situation. That was like the last 10 minutes of the movie. Yeah, yes, yeah. But it, but it was, but you're correct. It is based on, on Grenada. But, but Panama, Panama, I mean, Panama's got some really, really interesting stuff. Um, really interesting stuff that one day will be told yeah one day uh now's the point of the show we get to the drinking bro of the week this one was submitted by sarah rhodes from tennessee uh she's only been a member of drinking bros for two months and uh she's nominating jack jones she said jack jones or i called him or as i called him grandpa jack was my dad's <laughs> best friend and filled the father void my dad had from losing his father at a young age Jack passed away unexpectedly Saturday morning. Thankfully, he spent Friday night surrounded by friends and family, just bullshitting and uh, talking about things that, that he loved and was great at. He was a Marine and served in Vietnam. He was a police officer in Heath, Ohio for 25 years and was a firearms instructor for his retirement gig. He was not politically correct, as we are not, uh, but he was hilarious. Facebook often puts him in Facebook jail for his post they used to uh, about democrats he would make fun of you but he would give you the shirt off his back i'm nominating him for drinking bro of the week because he is a patriot and a family man who has left a huge hole in the heart of everyone who knew him i think that he would want to be known for what he did not die from the rona uh but a heart attack uh i am sure he is in valhalla saying no damn Chinese virus is going to take me out. <laughs> <clears throat> Cheers. Uh, That's Cheers. the only reason I hope there is an afterlife so I can talk shit to people in the afterlife. Yeah. Like, hey, you know, we we all saw what you did. <laughs> you piece of shit. You kidding me? Come on. Like people that thought they died and got away with everything. Well, I'm dead now. Fuck it. Nobody knows. We know, and now we're here. Yeah, now we're here now. That's what I want to do. And then we do another life. My only fucking uh, attachment to the afterlife is the fact that I might be able to troll there, and that says all you need to know about me. I am a piece of shit. You don't want to go back in time and bang like Marilyn Monroe or anybody? No. Okay. No. Huh. Uh, you know. Maybe Hitler. Fuck Hitler. I'd be, I'd Just be, to fuck with him. Yeah. You know what I mean? You would fuck him. Yeah. Obviously. Like he's in the shower, yeah. washing himself off. Oh, God. Oh, why? Why? Yeah. He's bleeding out of his and anus. And then maybe he wouldn't have done all that shit. Maybe not. What about you, Tyler? If you, if you, get, if you get to go back in time, fuck one girl from the past. Who is it? Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, oh, God. This is a tough one. Uh, it would have to be ooh. Cleopatra for me if it was an actual woman. By Mine's the way. Rosa Parks. In her youth or as an elderly woman? Uh, when she got off the bus. Like, that that was probably a feeling of power that no one knows. Just like say, hey, that was some super big tit energy, and I want to fuck yes, right dude. now. Right after she, she made the stand on the bus. I'm going to go, like, way back. Oh. Uh, oh, shit. Mary, Mary, like Josie Wales? Mary Magdalene? Josie Wales is a man, played by Clint Eastwood, by <laughs> the way. You know what, though? You, no, you know what? You know what? Who I'm going to go with? Queen of Troy. Ah, you're going way back in time. Yeah, but do you know why? No. Or Helen of Troy. Oh, Sorry, Helen, Helen of Troy. Troy. Why? I, I no idea what she looks like, but here's a fact. How many wars were fought over her? Yeah, she must have had like the ultimate pussy of all time. Like, we don't even know what the reasons why, but the fact nope. is, is like several countries invaded each other because of her. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take their word for it and my answer is Helen of Troy. That's a big one. That's what about what one. about I mean Joan of Arc was nineteen when she died. Mm -hmm. So it had to have been right there at the end. Although when she was alive, I think the age of consent was there was no Yeah, it was about eight. Women didn't have rights. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there, that's a there are situation. some cool but you know here's another one and I do not remember her name, but uh, I don't know if you know this, but Mulan uh, is based off of like basically it's a hybrid of three uh, female Japanese samurai. Mm. Ah, 
That's actually pretty dope because that was oh, obviously you gotta, you gotta not look up the common. Awesome. Yeah, there, were, there weren't a whole lot of j- female samurai, from what I understand. No, no, there were. It was. It was. <laughs> and but there were three that were like legit. That one was like used a bow. One used a uh, a spear called a nagadada, um, and I forget the other one. But they were like legit female samurais that like ran armies. Wow. And I think the third yeah. one was a dishwasher. I could see you being a bobbit girl. Lorena Bobbit? Yeah. I don't want She's my dick She's crazy, though. Yeah, I know, but, I mean, but you're, like, you're getting right on the <clears throat> right on the edge. There's a level. I'm I'm at the ideation level of crazy. Like, threaten to kill yourself. Pull, okay. pull a gun on me. But yes. don't kill yourself or shoot me. Okay, gotcha. You know what I mean? There's yeah. a fine line there. Gotcha. Come on. Okay. Uh, Tyler, you got a girlfriend now? Yes, I do. Yeah. There we go. You've been dating the same girl for a while now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Several years. Look at you. Hollywood superstar living the dream life. Uh, love, yeah, no, we no, love when you're on the show, dude. <laughs> you're, you're yeah, like, no, no. Uh, thanks for having me. No, it's, um, you know, things have been good, man. And it's one of those things where at a certain point, um, you know, with everything is, you know, you, you have to just, uh, at a certain point you have to accept kind of, kind of going back to my whole Clint Eastwood thing. It's like, just accept what, like, no matter what, no matter what anyone says, no matter what anyone's done, no matter what, at the end of the day, you are responsible for your own life and your own success or lack thereof, no matter what. Once you accept that, and no matter what anyone else has done, once you start going, you know what, but even if that was done to me, I allowed it to happen. What in me is allowing that to happen, blah, blah, blah. Once you go down that path, and once I kind of took that responsibility and really looked at everything and started working on things step by step, um, it's funny how quick you can you can change your circumstances uh, by taking responsibility for them. Yeah, no, nah, I agree. I agree. Uh, you're a great man. And uh, since you're wearing Bison Union, I'm going to go ahead and remind the audience that uh, there you go. Uh, Drinking Bros yeah, gets you 20% off. Hikes. I'm not wearing pants. But. <laughs> Drinking Bros gets you 20% off at bisonunion.com. It's our favorite <laughs> clothing line in the business. He does have a bison tattoo on his dick, though. Do you really? Yeah. Full. Yeah, it's, uh, well, the the bison has its mouth open, yeah. and that's like the head. Yeah. Oh, so that's nice. Yeah, it was really cool. Black yeah. ink. You go. Did you go black ink oh, on yeah. that dumb. Yeah. It's which is technically uh, stolen valor. If you tattoo your dick black, that's stolen valor. Yeah. In my <laughs> <laughs> that's so. actually really funny. I've never heard that before. That'd be really funny. <laughs> well, like, well, you know, I thought it would work. It's, uh, <laughs> not work. Just a quick tip for you out there. If you're rocking three inches, you might as well rack, rock it all black. Get it yeah, tatted black. Darken uh, it out. You'll confuse people. Exactly. Uh, Tyler Gray, well, we look forward you. to uh, SEAL Team coming yep. back. Check it out on CBS. I guarantee <laughs> it'll be back for another season. Uh, Hollywood yeah. doesn't have it's coming back. a choice, and the ratings are great on it. For Tyler Gray, D'Anthony D'Anthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone. <laughs>